Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Building Through Pain podcast. I am your host, Dillis, or some of you also known me as Diasafat, which is my writer name, which is a name that I use for my Medium account, uh, my X account, and uh, YouTube. So I... Today, I want to start by talking about today's weather here in Western North Carolina, and it is that time of the year where the seasons are changing, and we pretty much went from having a really, really hot summer to just really, really cloudy weather now, like during this transition, and as a lot of us already know this, uh, weather transition or seasonal transitions can actually cause a lot of depression or seasonal depression, whatever you might call it. And I am personally feeling the effects of that today. Um, how am I feeling it? I'm actually doing the same thing that I've done in the mornings, like the healthy routines I've been doing since last year. That involves me exercising. So what I did this morning was I woke up, I kind of did like my little grounding thing in the morning. And then this is like a new thing that I just added this morning. I'll talk about my grounding, uh, new grounding technique that I'm going to add into my mornings from now on to help my complex trauma to help cope, actually. Uh, so I, I had that this morning, I did that for like 30 minutes this morning, I usually not always, but I usually try to write, you know, put some words down on a page, uh, do some brain dumping exercise in the morning, um, or whenever I want. So I do that. And I went to the gym, I worked on three machines, and then I went for a walk. So that was my morning. And I usually have like a third or half a cup of coffee in the morning too. Although there are days that I just take a break from all caffeine. But anyway, even with all this, I'm still feeling like a lack of energy. When I was walking in the park in the Greenway, I was feeling good, you know, I was okay, I was out moving around, I was in nature, I was, you know, I see other people working at the park, I get to say hey, and blah, blah, blah. But I'm still, I can still feel that my energy was still not on par, which is okay. It's the awareness of like how our energy level that can help us, you know, develop coping mechanisms. So I do want to talk about yesterday, I restarted therapy um, with a therapist that is used to working uh, on like interpersonal, relational, domestic uh, stuff. Okay, let's say stuff. Um, she is a therapist from the women's shelter. So that tells you, I mean, to me, that tells me that she is like, you know, from her experience, she is probably very, very trauma informed. I have worked with her before. But my, um, my language wasn't as mature before. So I couldn't really, you know, I couldn't really, um, I couldn't really like work with her too much. So that's why I took like a really long break, right? But anyway, so I started working with her yesterday. And I told her about the some of the situations that I'm going through. So I told her that my biggest issue right now is dealing with my very, very, very difficult, uh, actually very, very abusive, verbally abusive, not physically abusive, very verbally abusive father. Um, so that was uh, my main thing. And she gave me two tools after she listened to me talk for like 45 minutes, right? It was an hour, like, therapy sessions. So she gave me these two, two tools. And I would actually want to I would like to share these two, two tools with you guys. Plus, some of the other tools I found really, really helpful that I'm using in combination, along with exercise and 
Or uh, you know, other self care routine which involves like socialization and everything, right? So here it goes. Um, actually, I'm going to、um, save what the therapist told me l- for later on in this episode because I want to talk about something that I found two weeks ago. Ah,、uh, I happened to come across. Content by this lady. She is probably in her late seventies, early eighties now. I'm thinking. Anyway, her name is Byron Katie. It might ring a bell for some of you, and it may not. It does not matter because I'm going to talk about the method that I've learned from her. So Byron Katie is famous for something called the work. She calls it the work. She、uh, was an alcoholic and.、Uh, Attic, and I think she was on the floor of her, um, of the of a、uh, halfway house one day or night. I can't remember. Ah,、uh, she was sleeping on the floor, and a cockroach crawled on her foot, and she woke up. What is significant is that she woke up before her ego or inner monologue could catch up. So she had this space between. Her awakened hour, awakened seconds—I don't know how long it lasted. Her awakened、uh, period of time, and before her ego popped in and you know started producing all these thoughts, right? And this is kind of Buddhist in a way, I think. Like even though she doesn't talk about Buddhism,、uh, I do. Ha- I did. I have spent a tremendous amount of time in the past few years trying、uh, studying Buddhism, trying to you know. Understand things, trying to heal myself and all that. But anyway, so this is why you will hear me talk about, you know, my understanding of what I've studied in Buddhism. I will, I would mix that in, of course, along with my other, like, understanding, other insights、uh, that I can come up with at this point. So, don't take my advice as absolute truth. I don't believe in absolute truth. Um, even the stuff that even what I've just said about absolute truth. Is probably not the absolute truth, so I just want to throw that out there.、Uh, if you find, if you ever find anything helpful, you're more than welcome to, you know,、uh, use like listen to it. If I ever say anything that doesn't, you know, that is not helpful to you, please feel free to disregard it. I have to learn to do this myself. So here it goes. Byron Katie's the work is. Actually, consists of four questions and three turnarounds. It is a self inquiry process that involves questioning and challenging stressful stressful thoughts in order to gain clarity and inner peace. So, why do we want clarity and inner inner peace? Personally, I'm into personal development. I need clarity and inner inner peace so I can, you know, like. Fulfill my purpose, so I sort of have an idea of what my values are, what my goals are. I also believe that I don't think we have to have absolute clear goals before we take action. As long as we have like an enough of an idea, even just like a vague direction, I think it's enough for us to actually go ahead and take action. So, <clears throat> challenging, like up.、Uh, Stressful thoughts. Stressful thoughts is what causes us, us to, you know, lose that inner peace. Ah,、uh, stressful thoughts and feelings、um, leads to, you know, certain type of behavior that is not beneficial to ourselves and others.、Um, so we want to avoid that, right? This is why we're here on this podcast or consuming.、Uh, You know, content that could help ourselves. That's about you know growth and personal development, or you know seeing a therapist or whatever. This is why we're doing this work. So, I find self inquiry very important because, like, throughout the day, there are so many thoughts that come up that are actually very, very unhelpful. When I say unhelpful, I mean that these are the thoughts that actually cause us stress. I'm not really talking about like you know external stress right now, like dealing with like a, a verbally very verbally abusive father, which I'm dealing with.、Um, 
But I'm also talking about like inner thoughts, like thoughts that that's generated either through you know like our past experience, like conditioning, or what we're going through even now. We can't really control what's outside of us. Like I can't control how my dad behave, like with me or you know other people. It, I can't control that. What I can control is like you know maybe block him on the phone the way he can't like call and bitch me out or shame me or whatever that he does. Ah.、Uh, Uh, what I can also do is like try to talk to my thoughts. But in order for us to actually even go to the part where we can talk to our thoughts, is we need to be more aware of you know when these thoughts arise. So for me, when I start feeling not generous, if I start feeling sad, depressed, uh, envious, any of those so-called "Quote unquote negative emotions," which I would like to reframe that as unhelpful emotions. Anytime something uncomfortable, like an uncomfortable feeling in my body, or uncomfortable thought that causes like a feeling, or maybe an uncomfortable、um, uncomfortable feeling in my body that causes the thought arises, I try to use these four questions and three turnarounds to. Help me slowly adjust the part of myself that I can control. Again, this the part that I can now control is me questioning my thoughts. So, okay, so here it goes. Um, imagine that you're really upset because your friend canceled plans last minute. So now you have this stressful thought that comes up that makes you feel like shit, like whatever, like such as, "Oh, my friend doesn't care about me." You know, like it's normal. You know, when we're being disappointed, when a disappointing event happens, sometimes stress, stress, stressful thought would creep in like this. So the thought now that we're facing is, "My friend doesn't care about me." So the first question that we ask is. Is it true? So we ask ourselves the statement: "My friend doesn't care about me." So the an so so sorry. So we might answer: "Is it true?" As you know, yes, it feels true because you know it feels true right now because that's how you're feeling, right? Okay, that's fine. So we go to the next question. Can you absolutely know that it's true? By the time we go to the second question, a few seconds has already been delayed between yourself and the situation. You see, so when we ask the second question, we might actually reflect an answer. No, I can't absolutely know it's true. Like you know, maybe my friend had a good reason. Blah 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 blah. So, this is actually true. Whenever we have a thought like, "Hey, my friend doesn't care about me," like you know, we this like did did they say like they don't care about us? You know, like they didn't, right? In this situation, it's just that you know your friend canceled a plan, hanging out plan last minute. We don't exactly know what is going on, so so we can't absolutely know that it's true. Okay, that was the second question. The third question is: How do you react? What happens when you believe that thought? So personally, when I believe the thought that "Hey, my friend doesn't give a shit about me, doesn't care about me," it makes me feel like shit. Like this person is my friend. If I admit to myself, or if I tell myself that you know, like they don't care about me, then of course I'm going to feel like shit. So. This is this is for this third question. This is the part where we actually explore how this thought affects our emotion, and I find this part extremely powerful to actually notice how the thought is making us feel. For me, this is this is enough to make me, you know, want to question more, which leads to the fourth question: Who would you be without? The thought. So for me, it would be like, say, if I don't think of my friend as not caring about me, I would actually feel more relaxed and 
compassionate, I would probably reach out to see if everything is okay with them rather than thinking, hey, they don't give a shit about me. You know, I'm not, I don't give a shit about them too. You know, that's just a normal reaction when we see that another person's doing something, you know, like kind of negative towards us. That's like a, like, I don't want to say normal reaction. That's usually like a first reaction, like a non, like non-spacious reaction. That means that we didn't give it like some space. We didn't give it like a certain amount of time for us to actually, you know, be out of that highly emotional state and actually fall back down to like, you know, I guess like our baseline, our emotional baseline, where we can actually look at the situation from a more neutral point of view. For this case, again, for this case, when the friend canceled on us, we don't know why they canceled. And if the first thought that we hop into, which is, I think it's normal is to be defensive about it, is to, to tell ourselves that, you know, hey, they don't care about us, then that seals the deal. That just, you know, that just shuts you off. That just disconnects you with, you know, like to both your friend and to ourselves. Why does it disconnect like us to ourselves? Because it doesn't allow us the space to actually question, to have these self inquiries. And I just feel like these self inquiries is just a way to connect with ourselves, right? We, we become very, very traumatized, especially if we grew up in a very difficult environment, like with unsupportive parents who most likely have, you know, uh, serious undiagnosed, uh, mental challenges, uh, which is not their fault. And the way we were brought up, the way we were treated, were also not our fault. We have done our best to do what we need to do to survive, to become who we are. And there are certain things that we are actually very, 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 really, really, really good at, which a lot of us do not give ourselves credit and we also have things that we need to work on. This is the same for everybody, even for those who doesn't have or doesn't identify with having like a uh, complex or childhood trauma or trauma for that matter. Anyway, uh, so besides the, these four questions, uh, the first question, is it true? Second question, can you absolutely know that it's true? Third, how do you react to what happens when you believe that thought? And fourth, who would you be without the thought. After these four questions, there's another part to Byron Katie's The Work. So we have something called the three turnarounds. So this is the part where we explore the opposite or different perspectives of our original thought, which was, my friend doesn't care about me. The original thought that makes us feel like crap. So here it is. Number one is to turn it around to the self. So instead of saying, my friend don't care about me, I don't care about me. Why do we turn this up, up thought around? Because this actually encourages us to reflect on how we might not be taking care of our own needs or feelings in the situation. Maybe we're not being compassionate with ourselves or addressing our own emotions. Unfortunately, I feel like this is the case uh, most of the time for many of us. Again, uh, I've seen this also in people that are not identified uh, with, you know, being traumatized or anything. So this is not just something like this is not just something that's for like traumatized people like me or maybe you are you identify with that too. But Anyway, there's the second turnaround. The second turnaround is to the other. So instead of saying, my friend doesn't care about me, we flip that around to the other, like to the other end by saying, I don't care about my friend. Uh-huh. Now what? This could actually help us realize that we may not be considering our friend's circumstances or reasons for canceling, you see. Uh, 
Maybe they had a valid reason, and maybe we're just focused too much on our own disappointment. Honestly, they could have a valid reason, or maybe they don't. So what? When we asked, when we asked our initial original question, when we when we stated the original thought, which was again, my friend doesn't care about me. This was pretty much a reflection of our disappointment. So know that we sometimes come up with these thoughts as like you know a, I don't know an answer to dis towards disappointment. So. And then we have one more turnaround, and I think they they call this turnaround to the opposite. So it goes like this: My friend does does my friend does care about me. So here we actually look for evidence that our friend does care. For example, because they've been there for us in other situations, that's why we're friends, right? I mean. Hopefully, you know.、Uh, so maybe they, you know, like maybe before they've apologized for canceling or something like that, like you know, friendly gesture things that supportive things that they've done, so that that proves that they care.、Um, this third turnaround actually helps us to see things from a different angle, and it actually sometimes bring more clarity. Compassion and understanding to the situation. So, I actually told my therapist about these uh, uh, about Byron Katie yesterday. I, actually, I wasn't trying to tell her anything, but I asked her. I told her like, "Hey, I found like you know this uh these methods by this person called Byron Katie about two weeks ago, and she never heard of her, but she did ask me to read her these four questions and three turnarounds. And guess what she told me? She said that. Oh, actually, she, so so she asked.、Uh, she I told her about these、uh, four questions and three turnarounds, and then she said that yeah, of course these are good questions, blah blah blah. blah. And then I asked her, I was like, would I still, you know, would it still be like a good idea if I use the same like Byron Katie's method with someone who is verbally abusive, like? Because that's something that I just kind of like been going through my head right in the past two weeks. Me、uh, using her method, and my therapist said the point. She said yes, because the point of using these, you know,、uh, this these sorts of method is to put space between you and. She didn't say you and the issue, but I can't really think of other words right now. Yes, is to put some space, some distance between you and the issue. So that was I thought that was a really powerful thing to say or to do. And after that, my therapist gave me two tools to help me deal with my father. Right, because I have chosen to not to just. Cut him off. I do take breaks. Like I've blocked my dad since last, I think Saturday or Sunday now because he, like, he's going through his um cycle again, which he just goes through these cycles again and and again and again and again. It gets like super intense sometimes. Uh, and it was my fault that I did not realize that it has got to me. Like after one month of you know hanging out with him. You know, like I don't know, just、uh, it has got to me to the point where you know I like kind of like behaved inappropriately. So yeah, that was my fault. I did not catch that earlier. But anyway,、um, two of the tools that my therapist gave me to deal with my very difficult dad is to one establish. Boundaries. I have established verbal boundaries with my dad before, but it doesn't click with him. It sometimes it would click like for a few days, and then like when he goes back, like he just doesn't give a shit. So it just it doesn't like it doesn't stick. So that doesn't work.、Um, me telling him the verbal boundaries doesn't work, and、uh, me telling the myself the boundaries also 
hasn't really like work as well. But this is what's like interesting about what the therapist told me. She said she told me to write out what I will, I won't, and may be able to tolerate. So I actually did that last night. Um, there's something really powerful about writing. I can't really verbalize it just yet, but like when I when I pretty much lost my expression, my articulation, I like the writing was what helped me open up and rediscover my expression. Right, so maybe that's one of the things about writing. But anyway, so I wrote out last night in the evening in my journal. I wrote out three columns. Right, so the first column is the things that I won't tolerate. I will not tolerate shaming. I will not tolerate accusations. I will not tolerate controlling behaviors. I will not tolerate gaslighting. I mean, that sounds fair, right? And then I put maybe in the middle column. I haven't like I haven't. I don't have anything right now in that column. I feel like if I put down maybe, it's just too vague. So I don't want to like actually disrespect my own boundaries. So I don't have any like vague. Maybe I have to with someone that's with someone like my dad. I I feel like I I should just be like kind of you know boundary wise only be kind of like very very clear kind of black and white about it. So I did I did write out like you know like what I will tolerate, which is like you know normal respectful behavior. But I didn't write that. I I I got more clear about it. I got more detailed about it. I wrote. Shopping together, you know, minus shaming, accusations, controlling behavior, gaslighting.、Uh, I will tolerate shopping together, like a you know, like normal relationship, healthy relationship. I will tolerate taking him to the doctor without, again, without shaming, accusations, controlling behaviors, gaslighting. I will also tolerate him buying me stuff because I can see that he like he feels good about himself when he buys me stuff. I don't care if he buys me a loaf of bread; that's cool. I will take bread. I eat bread and makes both of us happy. So as long as he only does that again without the shaming, accusations, controlling behaviors, gaslighting, that is cool. So that's how I do it. So that's one. Tool that my therapist gave me yesterday. The other thing that she suggested me doing is to actually establish a grounding practice. So, grounding practice could be like there's like so many different like grounding practices out there. She did mention that、um, I should practice, you know how like you know the the five senses thing. Like I don't know, there's like I know there's a name. There's probably a name for it, but it goes something like you know when I'm in a difficult situation, like you know if I'm not like in immediate danger, you know if it's just someone kind of you know talking shit. <laughs> Like you know, my dad like going through his cycle. Say if I'm stuck in a vehicle with him while he's going through the shaming thing, if it's not too much for me, which like I think the amount of you know the amount of stress facing these kind of situation will lessen as I deepen my practice. Anyway, to 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 actually do this grounding practice is to like you know. Like say if you have like bracelets on you, or、uh, you feel the bracelets, maybe you can count the beads on the bracelet. Um, maybe I don't know if I'm stuck in a vehicle. I open the window and I feel the wind, you know, like hitting my face, or I smell the freshly cut grass outside. Something, something that engages our senses that brings us back into our body. Like that's like my understanding of it. So. When she said that, it reminds me of like I stopped meditating sometime last year. I think around this time, maybe I was doing like daily formal sitting meditation for a few years, and I decided to stop for a few reasons, which I don't want to go into here now, but um. I, because of what my therapist said about this grounding practice, I resumed my 
sitting meditation practice this morning because I really need to develop a grounding practice. Uh, meditation, since I've already said something in Buddhism called shamatha, which is calm abiding meditation, since I already learned how to do that, I just kind of use that. Um, I like what the therapist suggests, like say if you have like bracelets and stuff, like she wears a lot of bracelets, like, you know, I have, I don't wear jewelry, so I don't have something like this. So I keep, so I was thinking, you know, like, it's probably better personally, again, it's probably better to actually develop a, or, or develop or keep practicing a practice where I have an object that's always with me. And what is this object that's always with me? It's the breath, right? We're not dead yet. Like, you know, I don't have to have something that's on me. I don't have to have like a certain situation to actually have this grounding. What if I don't have like my bracelet with me that one day, you know, I don't want to like rely on only that. So this is why I choose to go back to sitting meditation, particularly shamatha, which is again, calm abiding. So what I what I do is what I did this morning is I uh I did like a very relaxed quote unquote relaxed like ruleless type of shamatha because when I used to sit for shamatha I literally I said like I, I was doing kind of like properly you know I said like I said lotus position you know with my feet uh both of my feet touching my thighs, I'm that flexible. So I did that and I, yeah, and I was just, you know, like trying to bring, trying to train my mind to bring my focus back to my breath. That's the whole idea of grounding practice, right? To bring our self back to, you know, from like becoming distracted or becoming more stressed because of, you know, external uh, situation. We're just trying to bring ourselves back. And that's what I do in calm abiding. Anyway, I can feel my energy kind of dropping. Uh, but I do want to mention that. And then there's another practice that I want to mention. This is very important. And I picked up this practice from... Uh, this lady that's on YouTube, uh, she is called the Crappy Childhood Fairy on YouTube, and her practice is called the Daily Practice. I think she used to, I mean, uh, she she talks about like complex trauma a lot. Obviously, this is the reason why I was attracted to her um, content two years ago. I actually took a break from her probably for like the last year I pretty much took a break from complex trauma content all year because like you know sometimes you just get to take a break and just you know go back to it if when you need to this is what I've been doing lately I just kind of went back to certain type of content to try to discover more stuff that can help me and then and then I can you know share and like hopefully it could I could help other people with it too, but through my own lived experience. But God, I digress so much. But like uh, going back to the daily practice by Crappy Childhood Fairy, which she has this, the daily practice for free on her website. You can just like sign up with her. It's completely free. Um, but I do want to touch base here about this practice. Uh, but I find, because I find this very helpful. So her first practice within the daily practice is called fear and resentment practice. So this is actually very close to something like a brain dump practice for me. So what happens is that we do this on paper, right? Again, there's something magical about writing stuff out onto paper or on a screen, typing it out on the screen. Yeah, same. Very, very therapeutic. So talk about how I've been doing. Oh, sorry. I'm literally reading like the note that I'm supposed to. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm reading the note that like of what I'm like, what I want to talk about. This is how out of it I am today. But yes, I want to I need to talk about. So sorry. 
So in the fear and resentment practice, we um, we take out a piece of paper or you know write on the blank screen or a screen something. So we talk about things that that we res- that we resent or we are fearful of. So for example, um, let me try to come up with one real quick. Um, I resent. I resent Philip for, you know, uh, beating me in everything because I have fear that he, no, sorry, God, I'm not on par today, but (laughs) sorry. So we talk about, we say I have resentment at Philip or something because I have fear that he is doing better at everything than I am. Like, which this is actually a real situation of mine with a different name, okay? Um, so the point is to write out the person or the thing that you resent and then use because I have fear that blah, 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 okay? Uh, or you can also say I have fear about blah, 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 blah because I have resentment at blah, 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 blah. So Write that out. Uh, she suggested that to do this twice a day, um, not just only venting or brain dumping. It's also very important to do something called signing off. So after we do this brain dump practice of writing out our fear and resentment or resentment and fear, you know, we can get as ugly as we need to, okay? No judgment here. No one else is going to see your shit unless if you really want someone else to see it, blah, blah, blah. No judgment. So you can get as nasty, as petty, as bitchy as you want. Go for it. Lash out onto this blank page, this paper. Again, no one's going to judge you except for, you know, our own inner critic, which if that inner critic comes out to judge us for being ugly, bitchy, mean, petty, then we see the inner critic. We keep being judgy, (laughs) petty, bitchy, not to other people, not to the exterior world, but we do this on paper or on the screen, okay? But besides of just venting, we have to sign off. We sign off by saying something along the line that something like this. I'm now ready and hereby release these fears and resentments so that I can have a clearer vision of what I should do today. And so I have the focus and the energy and the inner calm to do that at my best ability. Dillis. So that's how I do mine. Um, That's exactly what the crappy childhood fairy uh, gave me. Uh, she has another sign off um, option for those of you who believe in a higher power or God or, you know, just believe in a higher power. For me right now, it works better for for me to like, you know, just seek my inner higher power. So this is why, <clears throat> excuse me, this is why uh, my sign off is like this. But the signing off part is very important after any event, venting. I don't think venting, whining, bitching, like is necessarily negative unless if we do that to other people, because a lot of times it's just too much for a lot of people. Okay. Uh, You're lucky if you have a friend or like a support group that is continuously able to, you know, like listen to you vent and do that like you know what you need to do to make you feel better but i also find that it could be actually very very we can actually feed into our own negative thought loop if we only vent or whine without actually uh having some kind of closure you know or a purpose to our venting whining uh complaining or whatever that we need to do i'm not saying this like in a judgmental way like because i do it too like i do it so freaking much i have done it so much to some people where they just pretty much told me like i am a negative ass person like you know just and then they kind of you know just whatever and then 
that's just kind of you know it kind of it can de- they can de- uh, destroy relationships that way. Okay, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. So the whole point of us, you know, practicing these is that we become more healthily connected to ourselves and others. That way, we can, you know, fulfill our purpose. Because it's actually very difficult to fulfill a purpose if we only work. By ourselves, like if we're working only by ourselves, we're most likely not going to do anything that's going to be that beneficial, at, like to, like both ourselves and the society as a whole. So, um, yes, the whole point of venting and having upsetting events is. To actually give ourselves the opportunity for practice. What do we practice when something shitty comes up? When, like, you know, either it's something that's happening exterior, externally now that you can't control, or something that's internal, like you know, our mind, our ego, mind playing, replaying certain traumatic events or unsatisfactory events or disappointing events. When it happens, a lot of times when we when these thoughts are stuck, it's because we haven't been able to completely process it. And what I've learned, this might sound you know repetitive to you guys, to some of you guys, but what I've learned is like in order for us to process things, we must face it. Face it by meaning facing the situation. And facing the emotions, particularly the like the the uncomfy emotions that arises, we have to face it, face these, and then we name them. So, for example, if an external situation was disappointing, we name that. We just call it disappointing. I mean. Same as like say with my father when he becomes you know when he gets into cycle and becomes like verbally abusive with me, uh, that is a disappointing situation. So I think it's safe to say that you use the word disappointing if we like if only if we can't really label a situation in a helpful way. Okay, so we name it or label it. We name the situation. We also name our feelings. Ah,、uh, this part really takes some more practice. I do suggest you guys to work with、um, a professional with this, ah,、uh, because they are professionals. They work with hundreds of you know clients already. They've been educated about this. Um. So anyway, to name our emotions, we can use the emotional wheel or emotions wheel. We name the exterior world. We we name the exterior situation as disappointment, or you know something that's like a helpful, less biased、um, labeling. We face it and we name it to become free of it. This is how we process things. And yep. I have pretty much just used up all my energy for the morning. It is eleven sixteen, and I have pretty much reached the end of my energy level. And then I realized that I left out one thing. Another part to the daily practice by the Crappy Childhood Fairy is. Meditation, aha.、Uh-huh. So after we do the fear and resentment practice on paper on on a screen, which is a type of brain dumping practice, we sit down for meditation. Now, the crappy childhood fairy, her name is Anna. Ah,、uh, Anna does a type of TM, which is transcendental meditation, which was founded by a guy called Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Uh, she in her program she suggests to do transcendental meditation. So for her, like she's got like a mantra that she kind of like stick to, or like a, a sound or whatever. Uh, for me, I was never really. I mean, I was trained in like using sound too, but that didn't really stick with me. Again, for me, since I did shamatha the most, I I just stick with shamatha. So that's what that's exactly what I did this morning. I did. The fear resentment practice. I, 
you know, vent and then I sign off. And then, sorry, very, very important part. After we sign off, we destroy that note. So I destroyed my note by throwing that in a trash can. I wrote it on a sticky note and I threw that shit in the trash. If it makes you feel better, you can burn that shit too. Yeah, just saying. I might try that tomorrow. But anyway, we're supposed to do this twice a day. So do fear and resentment practice in the morning and then 20 minute of meditation in the, in the, after that and then repeat again in the evening. Ideally, I know a lot of you guys are busy people. Uh, if, if you can't do, if you can't sit 20 minutes for meditation, you can sit for five. If you can't sit for five, you can do one. Okay. So, I mean, everyone's got one minute, like that's literally 60 seconds. And then we can just build from there. So, um, time management is also a huge thing that helps, uh, on my journey. Another thing that really helps, um, I know it's still kind of chaotic today, this uh, podcast, I did lay out, I did lay out like a note sheet, like a, a, a list of stuff that I want to talk about for this podcast. So I am doing slightly better than my last two. Um, if you guys have any suggestions, you can go ahead and drop me some suggestions in the comments box. Otherwise, I think I'm gonna go take a nap. So I thank you, you guys for your time. I hope you guys have a good day or have a good week. And I hope that was somewhat helpful, or at least, you know, like, generate some new ideas or something for you guys to uh contemplate upon uh like whatever do you want to do so or maybe you just you know want someone to keep you company and hey that's cool um listening to podcasts are a really good way to keep yourself company so i i wish for your success in whatever you choose to do. Um, and I will see you guys later. Thank you again. Bye.